Okay, here we are. It's a given Thursday. It's the 3 o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. Welcome to Think Tech yet still again. This is Think Tech Talks, and we have with us an old friend, Gordon Fuller, who is a social entrepreneur and who is, in fact, aging even as we speak. I just felt it just then. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, Jay. Hey. It is so nice to have you. Uh, you know, I met Gordon at uh, a number of um, Hawaii Venture Capital Association Think Tech meetings, and he was always so engaged in what was going on. He had such good questions, such thoughtful remarks. You know, it's the kind of guy, you know, you remember and you remember for a long time. So, Gordon, I, I have great admiration for you and I enjoy your mind, okay? Thank you, my brother. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, so we styled the show today Social Entrepreneurship in an aging world. This is not only because Gordon is aging, it's because we're all aging. <laughs> at the tail end of the baby boomers here. That's right. Yep. We're talking about the baby boomers. That's right. But we're also talking about, you know, a, a hot sustainability type of topic that is social entrepreneurship. Because in the world today, you know, it gets kind of complicated out there in industry and the world of, you know, global capitalism. And we have to be more thoughtful about it. So. Uh, Gordon, you know, I'd like to talk to you about that. Get your thoughts about it. You, you've been in both, you know, both ends of that, yeah. uh, the entrepreneurship side and the aging side. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts about what you're doing, how you're conducting yourself between these two, these two polar extremes, and, um, and you know, what your advice would be to others, including me, myself, and I. Well, I, I so appreciate you having me on the show, Jay. Uh, it is something I have a lot of passion for. And it comes out of the fact that I am an industrial designer, studied in the Bauhaus tradition in Europe, uh, industrial design. And then about the age of 19, oh, keep going. About the age of 19, I discovered that uh, I had a progressive vision loss that would lead to blindness. And it seemed to me in those times, back in 1974, that it was in my interest to take a, a look at what the future might hold as people age or experience illness, impairment, uh, disability. And what I learned along the way is that it's a market that isn't understood, uh, not studied particularly well. And those of us in the business uh, community should kind of take a look at what it, in, it's going to be for us going forward. I mean, we have around the world 27 of our first world nations all at the same time experiencing the same phenomenon and that is people are getting older and a considerable number of the population it's said that by 2020 we'll have as many as 45 percent of our population will be over the age of 65 right now here in Hawaii it's 28 percent now that's never happened before in the history of the world that there were so many uh, people of age uh, older age age where people would be considered to be retired why, why should we be concerned about that? Well, it's only that um, just in the area, as people age, one of the things that happens is impairments. And uh, that is to say just the natural process of slowing down, uh, getting a little hard of hearing, a little less vision. Uh, how do we accommodate that? That's, that's the, the issue. And when you look at how many people there are versus how many people we have in the workforce, you see sort of an imbalance. We're at a point in time right now where there's about seven care, uh, there's uh, seven care providers for uh, uh, people with disabilities uh, or impairments or illness to choose from. Mm -hmm. In the years ahead, that's shrinking down to three over the next five years. Per person. Per person, yeah, mm -hmm. available. So it's less available. Yes. You're more on your own. This does not bode well for the quality of your your elder life. No, and in fact, you know, it's in all of our interest. It was in my interest when I was younger when I realized that I might be facing this challenge. Uh, but now it's in the interest of all of us, um, and indeed, as we age, we need to think of how we'd like to be treated, what kind of world we're going to be living in. And the good news is that we're all living healthier, longer, better, particularly here in Hawaii. Um, and we're probably not really wanting to retire anyway. Here you and I are, gentlemen that I suspect will never stop doing what we're doing. And a great many of us are that way. And other people who have had long and good careers, they're at a point where they might be able to bring to their community some of those incredible skills they developed working in government or industry. 
and those people can be real lights in our community. We have a lot of heroes in our communities. Uh, we just haven't made a culture around that yet. And uh, the really good news that I'd like to share today is there is a lot of opportunity. And the really important trend also that's matching this is that we're weaving a new social fabric. You know, what television, radio, newspapers used to mean uh, in terms of conveying information today is largely being supplanted by the little magical glass wedges in our pocket. <laughs> and now with those devices, um, people are connecting to each other, finding out what their individual needs are, what their community uh, might require, how we might better serve uh, each and every person around us. Because in our human nature, it is that we like to share and care. It's just part of being a human being, our social uh, instinct. You sound very optimistic, but uh, let me you know, yeah. tell you that next week we have a program such as the kind of program you and I met at mm -hmm. uh, upstairs in the, uh, in the Pioneer Plaza, in yes. the Plaza Club, uh, called News Morphosis 3, Roman yes. 3 mm -hmm. uh, Online, which is really a study of the migration of news to online uh, media formats. Yes. And, you know, there's, uh, we, we have many issues to discuss. We just had our speaker conference call a couple of hours ago right here in this room. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, we have many issues to discuss, many concerns about the quality of news that we're getting, whether it's online or in the print press or the six o'clock news on TV, um, and how well the public is being informed or cares to be informed in what, what we have in our free society. Uh, and, you know, a lot, we take a lot for granted, you know, Gordon. A lot. And uh, so I think all the speakers have a little concern that, um, that w the, the way it's going may not deliver as much news, but the way the, the people who expect the news are going, maybe they don't expect as much news. And for the lack of engagement on news and information, even with all these, uh, what you say, the, the, the piece of glass in your pocket, yep. even with all of that technology, um, the free society requires that we be informed and Absolutely. maybe we're not being. Well, you know, gosh, I grew up with one scratchy TV channel picked up in the distant <laughs> canyon lands of Arizona. Uh, we had the Arizona Repulsive and Gazoo. Those were the, the newspapers, you know. I mean, well informed? Oh, please, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how well you get informed watching reality TV between you and me. Not much. But it's a personal choice for people. Sure. And, Regrettably, our educational system has been so in the tank for so long, uh, not to say we haven't had heroic teachers and good schools here and there, and <laughs> but it's really the case that it, the social fabric has disintegrated. And it's not, it's, not, uh, <laughs> it's not because the media or the technology is changing, it's just the lives of people are changing. Yeah. People now do, need to work three jobs. That's why we have an obesity uh, epidemic. People don't have the time to, to stop and eat dinner in between you know two jobs they have half an hour and it's mickey d's and the cost is right and so boom uh, and and the tr same is true with education you know uh, the young people are, are getting kind of short shrift they're not having an opportunity to apprentice to get an exposure to a lot of different trades and skills we've just sort of lost where we've been and where we're going you know and the truth is i believe in our communities i think we're the kind of people here in hawaii particularly uh, where we we take stock of our situation and we try to think about new things. We're very inventive. You know, this civilization that, that lives here in the Pacific has been here a long time. And my guess is with the new tools, we'll come to an age of increased localism. Uh, these tools will allow us to identify the kind of medicinal herb plants that we're looking for and who has them in a good way. We can bring those resources together. People can have little micro farms. Uh, when a, when a, a restaurateur uh, is looking for the right kind of kale or ginger, he can put in an order. That evening it's picked, and the next morning <laughs> it's delivered. They do this already. <laughs> and in the third world, particularly, they've really picked up the pace with, with technologies like this. Um, to, to me, there's a lot to be optimistic about. Um, the fact is our culture has lagged behind the science, the technology. Um, we, we really haven't had a good opportunity to share uh, some of the accomplishments, uh, and it's only been like a consumer culture. You know? Well, before we go to the 
you know, the, the points of how you tackle this problem, because yeah. I would like to explore all of them with you. Sure. I just want to do a definitional thing on the term social entrepreneurship. Yes. What is that? What is that for you? What is that in the context of our discussion today? Well, I'm one of those people, and it's an increasing trend, that looks for a triple bottom line. You know, doing good and doing well, you know, means uh, embracing community. I have a social responsibility. Um, I don't, uh, I help others start businesses. I advise and consult and, and help them spin them up, as I like to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we look for isn't so much that someone's going to take it public. I've done that. That's, you know, <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> but, but really, have a good, you know, meaningful employment. Uh, give a person a job that they love. They never have to work again. So if we're clever, and I think we are, we'll find ways where people can, you know, on their back and eye, grow beautiful orchids and get just enough money to add to their monthly incomes. And uh, we can also look at uh, people finding new occupations, uh, caring for others, and helping to uh, advise and support people in their immediate community. It used to be that the young men of the village were the engines of the community. They were the ones who tended the, the uh, fields, uh, the taro patches, and, and did the fishing and built the homes. You know, today, uh, some of our young people are just sitting about, you know, they don't have that kind of employment. But there are also people in our islands that are bringing them back together, showing them how to do these sorts of things. And one of them's a teacher. I saw a film called Ola. I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. it Don't spell it for me. Ola, Ola, O-L-A. Mm -hmm. It means life. And it's a film that went around the islands and interviewed people. They're really at the forefront of, forefront of social change, trying to find ways to feed people and teach them how to grow food, trying to find new ways to build homes in the old style, but with, with contemporary local materials. And uh, kind of picking up where we left off you know, a hundred so years ago, using today's knowledge and materials. We're, we're in a whole new culture shift in terms of even being consumers. We're in an age today where people will be able very soon to make their own products locally, you won't be importing them by the shipload, you know, and instead we'll, we'll find uh, new uh, uh, guilds of craft people in our community, among our young people and our elder people, um, where they'll come together to produce goods and services. Self-sufficiency. Yeah, we're going to we get better. That. I mean, every island community needs that. Yes. And every island community is capable of doing it. We are. So paint me a picture. You know, say, take me for a helicopter ride over this new world that you see coming. Mm -hmm. What does it look like here in Hawaii especially? Well, if we just kind of get the energy signature right, first of all, you know, we build, you know, very inefficient architectures that require air conditioning, and then we have to get like a power line, run it across the countryside, power up that building, you know, well, really, really, do we have to do that? It, tur it turns out if it's up to 89 degrees, if you have a fan, people stay nice and cool, you know, so build a taller ceiling, the heat rises up, you know, people in the building can stay cool. The Romans did this, you know, my ancestors, the Anasazi, native Pueblo people, they did this, Mexican people people do this. It's just not that hard, guys. And uh, then you kind of plant trees around the side where the sun's coming in if you don't like the sun. and You just start re-engineering the way you do things, more appropriate, more balanced, more designed to our local climates, you know, so from start to stem. Then you might think about transportation. It turns out Americans are one-third uh, as healthy as people in Great Britain. Must be their great food. No, not at all. Maybe their health care system. Nope. Turns out what it is is simply enough they walk all the time. They don't have uh, a car strapped to their butt, you know, going everywhere uh, they go. Uh, they walk to the market, they walk to the, the tube, they walk from home to office, and it's a healthy matter. And it's that simple. It's so simple. So simple. We can do this, you know. We can just think a little bit more about how we use energy. You know, the United States is the most consuming country in the world. We live out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and we've joined the club. You know, is it really necessary? What if we made more goods that were made locally, uh, produced crops that were highly valuable? Things like hemp, you know, which California is now racing forward with, state of Nevada also, mm -hmm. Oregon. Uh, these are crops that have traditionally time-honored uh, been great and very uh, useful crops. Uh, Canada makes $50 billion a year producing crops. You know, why don't we grow them here and produce cotton or blends of fabrics from these? And, our own fashions and be exporting to the region. You know, I'm sure we can do that. Yeah. And we will.
Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I mean, well, I'm sure we could. Yeah. And I mean, it would be a very good world, and it would support our population in style, and we would be able to learn and enjoy the benefits of self-sufficiency every day in every way. I mean, it's it's a utopia what you described, Gordon. Well, not working three jobs. I mean, I don't see where the American dream, you know, requires three jobs. Oh, I think three jobs really really steals <laughs> your life away. It steals no. your life away. Well, you know, and having multi generation families living together because there's no you know, affordable housing. I mean, we just haven't been very effective in, as designers. I mean, just bottom line, you know, could you design a better world? Well, sure, you know. Um, you'd have to work really hard to make one worse, frankly. You know, I mean, if you think about it, <laughs> cars, three, four thousand pound behemoths, a big metal shed with a running on stink oil, running down the road, you know. Really, to haul your 190-pound human butt around? That's just ridiculous, you know. I have friends around the world, Sweden, Silicon Valley, they're looking at putting up uh, pod car systems, which are powered by the sun, uh, big canopies rolling over the ro road beds, uh, photovoltaic panels running the distance of the road, electric vehicles, two and six passengers, computerized, mm -hmm. picking people up at bus stops and slinging them down the road. Mm -hmm. They could be very efficient. I'm told that it, they only use 20% of the energy to power the electric transit system. The rest of it goes into the grid. Okay. And, and uh, with it, uh, you could haul also uh, recyclables and freight deliveries, and then that might create some little neighborhood industry of rickshaw drivers or <laughs> paddlers pulling <laughs> buses. Get the exercise. <laughs> yeah. A little more Flintstones, maybe, but hey. But well, we're going to take a short break, Gordon. But when we come back, I'd like to talk about, you know, how to get there. We'll get serious. We, we <laughs> No, I think it's serious now. I, I absolutely agree with you. You paint a beautiful picture. Hey. And a picture worth, you know, making great sacrifice for, worth changing the paradigm for. Worth it. But when we get back, we'll, 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 we'll discuss step one. <laughs> step I'm one. ready. <laughs> okay, he's ready. This is Gordon Fuller, social entrepreneur who is, in fact, aging like the rest of us. Okay. And our entitled to today is Social Entrepreneurship in an Aging World here on Think Tech Talks. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. We're back. We're live. We're here at Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel with Gordon Fuller, a social entrepreneur who is, in fact, aging like the rest of us. And you'll see what we mean when we make that reference. Today's discussion is entitled Social Entrepreneurship in an Aging World. You know, the thing about Hawaii, you don't have to be heavily committed. You just have to see it as a place that's different. Okay? And, and the points of difference are wonderful. Um, it's not just the weather, it's, the, it's this earth, the sense of place around us, mm -hmm. it's the, the beauty of the connection of the sea yep. and the mountains and, and the sky and, and the people. And, you know, the polyglot diversity of the people is such a turn on. Absolutely. And great history. But you know what? Back in the 60s and the 70s, when people started coming in from all places in the world and bringing, what did you call it, Mac Macadie? Mickey D. Mickey D. Mickey D. Yep. Uh, you know what that stands for. <laughs> McDonald's. McDonald's. <laughs> they bring these culture points from far away, sort of level the old Okazuya. Yeah. And as a result, you know, we lost something in our heart and our spirit. And and you know, we have to we have to recreate that, but better than ever, better than we could ever imagine. And and you know, my view of it, and I'm sure yours too, is Gordon, is that's totally doable. Well, doable right now. It, it is one of the heritages of our lives, Jay, as you know, 
aging pop uh, generations. Um, we we are among the most optimistic generation there ever was. Good. You know, we we knew we could land people on the moon. You know how cool is that? We could invent lasers. Wow. You know put satellites in space. You know the, the build space stations. There it seemed like there was nothing we couldn't do. That's how we grew up. Um, and you know we had visions of uh, you know living in space and traveling around and it was just wonderful. My no brother, limit. No, no limit. limit. No, we could do anything. And. Uh, I'm afraid for the younger generation, they sort of feel like they've arrived at the beach after the party, and all there is is a cleanup now, you know? And <laughs> In some ways, that's totally true. <laughs> oh, man. You know, my heart goes out to uh, all the young people who won't grow up as I did with the kind of humble, quiet, calm, <laughs> much less populated planet. You know, at the same time, I find people very stimulating, and uh, I believe you can accommodate everyone quite wonderfully in balance by just thinking it out all you know all the way through it's not a popular thing in politics to think ahead very far uh, or in business for that matter if the next quarter your profits fall you're out of there you know but yet our society needs a, a longer range of vision you know we as individuals need vision you know where we think to ourselves what would the world be like what would we like to see it as so that we pass that on to our future generations. Not a destroyed world depleted of resources, all for what? You know, one generation's greed? No, we want to hand the world off in a better condition than we found it, if at all possible, with great ideas that can last a thousand years. I think that would be a good heritage, and I'm waiting for us to get to that part. And I think we're pretty close. We have oh, to first okay, well, <laughs> we have to first get really thoroughly disgusted you know, with this part. <laughs> you wouldn't measure a generation by its legacy. Yes. And and taking that down to the individual level, you measure an individual by its legacy. So if I tell you that I participated in something to make the world better, to, to make it easier for those kids to clean up after the party, then that validates and vindicates and you know, confirms the quality of my life. That's what I'm all about as well. Yeah. Uh, Jay, both of us, you know, that's, that's kind of our mindset. It's like, how can we contribute something, do good, do well, help the community, create jobs, you know, let's have people do things that are meaningful and important and embrace them in a positive way. I've been working on issues regarding people with disabilities, which includes, of course, aging people. Uh, I truly believe that disability only occurs when a society su insufficiently provides accessible accommodations so that an impairment does not become a disability. Yes. We're yes. only disabled by a discriminatory process. Yes. So I've been looking at that uh, from my own perspective, challenged as I have been by vision loss, um, and and coming to know the plight of other people. You know, we have had 25 years nearly of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We've been social innovators. We've led the world looking forward and saying we want every member of our society to have full inclusion. It's a historic and wonderful thing in the human uh, uh, community in our social evolution and yet <clears throat> today we're still at 75 percent unemployment for people with disabilities now that's not a very good record 25 years in mm -hmm. uh, some could argue oh well then we've just wasted all this money I say no we've actually invested very heavily in infrastructure might be their roads are falling apart our power lines are aging uh, but at the same time we actually have each and every one of our businesses, our community uh, resources, our governmental resources, all are fairly well accessible. And we in Hawaii, and this is some really good news for Hawaii, we are really good at accessibility, primarily because we're part of the United States and we've benefited from these very strict laws. But the good news is we've already spent the money. We've done it. <laughs> and look at that. We could get a little better. There's no question about it. But what if we actually embrace that and said, look at this, out here in the middle of the Pacific, of all your choices, aging planet, <laughs> you could come to Hawaii and find yourself in a wheelchair, very comfortable, very well accommodated, people treating you really well, mm -hmm. blind people, everyone, they could benefit coming to Hawaii and enjoying our wonderful resources, because they don't have this in Asia, they don't have this in South America, water sports, uh, paddling, uh, 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 you know, st you know stand-up paddle boarding. Uh, wrote, you know, uh, it was just wonderful, and and we have people catering uh, to people, uh, even when they have very severe impairments, 
taking them on scuba diving expeditions. And so we really have some first-rate infrastructure. And the research I've done shows that people who have impairments when they travel are every bit as profitable as tourists as people who are Japanese. And it's primarily because they travel with someone, they stay on property, they like package tours, and uh, they enjoy good amenities. Mm -hmm. so oh, well, that works. We can do good this way. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying you know, uh, that although we have a great corner on a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, for the elderly, for the disadvantaged, um, we have a long way to go. A long way. Because I, you know, it's like our appetites, our appreciation, our sensitivity to these, the morality of, of this, of this issue, um, you know, gives us expectations that we haven't met. Yes. You know, other places they may not even have the expectations. We know what's right, yes. and we need to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question to you, and I'd like to spend a little time with this, is. Uh, Let's assume that we agree on everything you've said, which I think is a reasonable assumption. <laughs> or, or violently disagree on nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, without, without, without getting to exactly how perfect that agreement is, <laughs> uh, what, what else do we need to do? What, what's the first step forward um, to bring our society here in these islands to the level of expectation, to the, you know, the social safety net, um, to making a, a heaven on earth uh, for seniors and, and elders and making life worth living right to the last moment. How do we do that? How do we create uh, not so much a laboratory but uh, you know uh, a perfect society, which I think is possible well, here. I think, Jay, you hinted at it earlier when you started this interview. You mentioned uh, uh, your concept, your conception, and that is we need a well-informed public. We need an engaged community. We need every one of us within the sound of our voices and telling all of their friends, you know, get involved, be a part of the community and, and take part in it, you know, get actively engaged, find something that is your passion, something you really care about and, and do everything you can to help others to take advantage of that, to enjoy it, to share it. And you'll find you're not working, you're really, you know, experiencing joy and sharing it. And uh, I just really think that there are a lot of people in our community that just haven't had the opportunity uh, to be embraced as part of community. That's it. You yeah. know, we need to find a way to reach to our communities, uh, all of them, and, and let them know that they're appreciated. And, uh, and that's what I really like about being uh, part of this wonderful community, is that it isn't a melting pot. That's a good thing. <laughs> In my opinion, true. some parts do not melt. Yeah, well, why should we melt anyone? We don't want it all to melt. We don't want to melt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> we, we like the, the wonderful blending, you know. It is a wonderful thing. You know, I really enjoy every kind of culture I've encountered. They have unique gifts to share, and I want them all to flourish and continue into the 22nd, 23rd century. Yeah, let me for a thought. You know, I've been writing a piece about this, and it strikes me. says, oh, Hawaii has got all this diversity. Isn't it wonderful? We have this diversity. It's um, you know all the people coming together and all that, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's it's not so much. And this is my point. It's not so much that we have the diversity. That's nice, but that's not the big thing that's happening. The big thing that's happening is the slow assimilation of the diversity. It's the process of letting the diversities touch each other, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. letting them learn from each other, letting yeah. them let them, them intermarry, engage together. Yeah. It's it's that it's that call it friction, call it assimilation, whatever you want to call it, yeah. synergies. Mm -hmm. um, it's the process of coming together that really makes it exciting. <laughs> I think so. I think it was his future people. You know, we're the advanced avant-garde of, of the people of the world. Here we are, all of these different beautiful peoples brought together and, and now uh, here we are out in the middle of the Pacific, you know, part of a great experiment, the United States and, and uh, the new uh, Hawaii of today. Uh, but, you know, what's to be tomorrow? And I think we need to look beyond, you know, where we've been. Looking in a rearview mirror is not a good way to drive, you know, take it from a blind man. Yep. No, we need to look ahead and begin to embrace the fact that we have a neighborhood that we live in and uh, some of our neighbors are not as fortunate. Some of our neighbors could benefit from some of our knowledge, some of our skills. We need to look more towards how we can increase our own trade in the communities of our islands.
here in the Pacific, uh, look to other nations, you know, as being part of our future as well. So what's the What's the mindset that you want to, you know, we have 15 minutes more here, <laughs> not enough time, <laughs> not nearly, but if, if you, you know, if you, what's the mindset you want to inculcate into somebody who is looking at this, you know, at some, at now or at some point in the future, what would you leave them with? And I'll give you a thought. Mm -hmm. the, the thought is this, that we are all going to age, even the mm -hmm. young among, among oh, us, yes. even the indestructible among us mm -hmm. will age. Mm -hmm. And we have to see ourselves sitting in the skins of, of the elders who populate our community. And we have to, we have to plan for our, our own aging, however old we are. Mm -hmm. anyway, absolutely. Tell, tell me your thought. No, absolutely. You know, in truth, I really think a lot of it can, can be done in different ways. You know, where, where I was living here before, uh, it was a big, you know, it was a tower, had two parking garages, and I thought, what I need to do is blow the parking garages and replace them with affordable housing for people who will be doing care providing. <laughs> and the other parking garage I'm going to turn into a cafeteria. Because, <laughs> you know, it was a whole population of aging people in these condos, right? I mean, my goodness, you know, uh, all of us would do better if our nutrition could be improved, you know, and, and, and monitored. When I was in China many, many years ago, one of the things that most impressed me is your doctor writes your prescription for your lunch. <laughs> you take it to the, to the kitchen, the cook will make you the very special dishes that have the nutrients or the herbs. A little ginseng in there. The things to put you back in balance, you know. And my goodness, that's a good idea, you know. Also, the way that the Hawaiian community used to join together, women, men, you know, eating communally. I mean, I often think, wouldn't it be great if my whole neighborhood uh, had a big gathering where we're sharing all of our harvests of our local trees and our fruits, and uh, we would have some of the folks cooking up dinner, and others would be playing musical instruments. We'd all be hanging out, having a good time, you know, <laughs> and that would be a good Hawaii. You know, uh, it is true that when, when the missionaries arrived here, I'm understanding, the first thing they noticed is that the Hawaiian people, well, I think they felt like they just didn't work hard enough, and they brought this to the king's attention. And he said, well, you know, uh, they've got all their work done. You know, we've been doing the fish and the taro fields and the huts are built. Everything's pretty good, you know, and they go, well, no, your, your people need to be industrious here. <laughs> so now, you know, 150 years later. For a moment, that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 150 years later, oh, yeah, we're more industrious here. Yes, indeed. So, but uh, getting less. Three jobs. <laughs> yeah, quite. And getting less industrious would be a good idea. You know, look, think about it. If you're growing food, wow, there's like $500, a thousand, and a monthly bill, you know. You, you, instead of like working some horrible job, why not go out there and work in the field for a while, bring home some groceries, you know? <laughs> I mean, maybe you don't have to pay tax on that kind of Well, I didn't say that, no, no. But, uh, you know, think about it. There's other ways to live that, you know, don't require so much from us, you know, the electric bills. You know, if I'm working to support a dumb three or 4,000 pound device that's parked for 23 hours of the day, you know, that's true. You know, it cost me sixty-seven thousand dollars because they got cars now that a blind man can drive. You know, you know. Now, what do I need that for? You know, no. I want to walk. I want to ride public transit. I want to be able to engage with people in my community, not isolate myself in the car cocoon. You know, as it drives me to work. You know, or even Wall Street the SUV Journal. with the tinted windows. <laughs> yeah. That one. yeah. Well, that's what they're going to need, the elites, you know, it goes this way. What we really need are people to invest in community, which is the thing you and I care most about, Jay, is how can we help uh, do good and do well? How can we share the wealth, spread, spread the opportunity, create more with less? That's it, you know, and we need more people to engage in that, eh? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so, you, you know, we styled it social entrepreneurship. Um, so, what entrepreneurs are we talking about? Are we talking about everybody? Are we talking about business people? Um, are we talking about business people who have a social bent, you know? Or do we want to make all business people people with social I think social we, awareness? I think, I think everyone needs a social awareness. Look, we're, we're born into a world uh, culture. Uh, we're born into a time and uh, a people. And uh, as much as anything, we're social animals. That's what's made us so adaptable and flexible. You know, we work together. You know, I, I watched, uh, I, I read the book of Stephen King, The Stand or something years ago, 
And it kind of haunted me because in this there's a super flu and all but 1% of the population is dead. And when you think about that, it's like, oh my goodness, who's going to go out there and turn off the nuclear missiles out on the <laughs> air base, you know? Who, who's going to go correct the dam settings, you know? Go make sure the power station is, you know, where the, the tanker was defueling. You know, wow, how would we do it? We're all so specialized. We have such technical uh, uh, systems in the world, but none of them are natural systems. And so if we just begin there saying, look, we're going to have to live more in balance with this earth, or it'll kick us off, essentially vote us off the <laughs> island. It is kicking us it off. It is kicking us <laughs> off. If we, if we get voted off this island, we're finished, you know. Uh, but indeed, if we could find a way to live more in balance, a famous picture I like is a picture of earth from space. At the daytime, it's a big blue marble, seas and green, ah, wonderful. At night, it's all just lit up with electric lights all over the world. So many of them in India and China. <gasps> <laughs> the world is not empty. It's full of monkey people everywhere, and we're and we're all we're all burning power, and, and none of it losing it up. And, and it's not natural. You know, we need to find a way to just kind of incorporate natural systems. So there's endless work for us. There's endless opportunity. It is just we have to make that commitment. We have to stop and say, look, what we're doing is a little bit crazy, and uh, to bring it back into balance is what it's about. Mm -hmm. So uh, talking about action points. I mean, what what is your advice, if it were, you know, if I may, to the to the political establishment, who presumably have the power to, you know, run things, but also change things. Yes. What do you say to them? You know, assuming they'll accept your advice, what advice do you give them? <laughs> I do give them. I, we can't advice. make that assumption. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I do give them advice. <laughs> do they listen? Ah. Well, you know, uh, I really think a lot of our people here are pretty good people. I have to say. Uh, even the bad ones aren't so bad, you know, I've lived in places where people are really bad. <laughs> no, this is a, a wonderful society, we have some good leaders, but you know, really, they're only as good as the people behind them. It really requires everyone engaging and being a part of that. I mean, you really don't have a democracy unless people are active and engaged and involved. And so, the problem is that everything's become so damn technical, forgive me, uh, beep, do that again. You, you, when you say technical, you're not running technology down, are you? No, no, okay. just that, that it's all so obtuse, you know? Okay. No human being could walk into the legislature, you know, and within it's 10 minutes... It's complex, for sure. ...understand what the A is going on there, you know? Yeah. It's, well, you have to really... Congress, you can't oh, Congress. Congress. Yeah. Gee whiz. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. No, so truly, it is that we really need people engaged and involved, and, and what we've seen in Congress, in fact, is a technical result of gerrymandering. <clears throat> when the Democrats are in power, they gerrymander. The Republicans are in power, they gerrymander. So you end up with these districts where only right wing nut, uh, I mean, uh, left and right wing nut balls. It's okay. <laughs> first Amendment is in place here. We, we, we abide by the First Amendment. <laughs> I'm, I'm awfully less fond about right wing nut balls just now. Okay. <laughs> but indeed, you know, that's only because we've, we've kind of created, you know, a, a distorted situation that isn't representative of people and getting a balance is everything. I really have heard in the last uh, two weeks with the government shutdown how you know the parties used to collaborate and work together. Even Ronald Reagan had to work with Democrats, you know, Tip, Tip O'Neill, and so everybody kind of had a little give and take. And where it all started going bad, you know, was back in Newt Gingrich and Clinton and all that. And so we're just kind of continuing in a legacy of you know non-functional government and that we can't afford we really need people that are at the top tier and this revolving door my goodness you serve in the congress you get you know goodies for life and you get to be a consultant after that what's your advice to them ah oh, i well, mean assume they'll accept it yeah well it would be campaign finance reform take the money out of politics should not be the way it is not at all no no it's got to change. That's just wrong. You know, you can do that here in Hawaii. For sure, you guys have a bill every year. Eh? You know, why don't you take it this time? Do that. Do the right thing. You know, I mean, you're the party in power. Go ahead. It's just, that's a wonderful, wonderful piece. Of <laughs> do the right thing. Do the right it thing. It doesn't require, you know, all kinds of definitional <laughs> no, laws on it. No. What about you, Gordon? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm interested to know, you know, how you express this in your actions every day. Well, what do you do? you know, to, to raise the bar, to make our society better. Well, I'm, I'm like you, Jay. I'm passionate about it. And, and when I was 10 years old, I used to hide under my desk, as instructed by my teachers, 
to avoid nuclear death. I you remember know? that. Yeah. We must be about the same age. Same <laughs> age, yeah. I mean, horrible sirens, scary ones, not yeah. the ones you have here. Yeah. You know, no. Yeah. And the teachers, everyone, they turn off the light, shut the curtains. You're hiding in your desk. But we've all seen the movie. We know we're going to die. And it was right about then that I figured out that adults are just crazy. And then someday I too will become, you know, bug nuts, uh, just completely <laughs> irrational. And I thought, well, my goodness, you know, uh, how does it happen when you're 15, 18, 21? And, and eventually I sort of forgot about it. And then one day I found I couldn't drive my beautiful car anymore. And I realized that I had entered into a relationship with that car where it was a part of my maleness to drive this thing. And it was me. I was that car, you know. And it wasn't reality. Reality was that I'm a human being and I'm trying to get around, you know. And that's three or four thousand pounds of metal, you know, powered by a hideously inefficient power plant that, you know, is destroying the world. You know, what a ridiculous situation. And it was then that I knew I too had become insane. So ever since then, I've tried to figure out how can I make a difference using what I know. And so I, I use media. I, I'm, I'm a frequent uh, blogger and I tweet and uh, I have a public access show that's running around the islands here Great. called Future Sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm also using polling. I'm going off to San Francisco right now to learn how to do community polling um, so that we can kind of take some of our issues. Uh, over on Kauai, for instance, there's a huge debate about GMOs, the seed uh, companies there spraying insecticides and you know not really checking in with the community and people have tried to rein them in on that and it's been kind of a silly business because you know everybody flip-flops on it it seems you know on the politics side and the truth is you know is an employer my goodness in the recession it's hard to you know vote them off the island and all that but really the bottom line is are we growing really profitable crops you know are there not other crops we could be growing and making more money at them and so creating a, a, a now a, uh, an issue which I'm bringing to the community which is you know should we grow hemp you know legalize and grow hemp. S Cynthia Thielen uh, favors hemp do you know that? Yes we're going to interview Cynthia we're interviewing the guy who's head of the American Hemp Industry Association Canada grows 50 billion so you know the question is should we do it and the good thing about it is it's not a divisive issue where the farmers are on one side and the old hippies on the other, <laughs> or the people that moved here or something, you know. <laughs> Instead, it's really more of, you know, coming together, like, yeah, we could do this, you know, we could do more with our community and bring it back into balance, you know. So to me, that's the kind of thing I'm focusing on is, you know, the little steps, you know, how can we just take, uh, and in truth, market-driven business approaches to the problems and unmet needs in our society, where there is a market solution we're better off. You know, if you require the government to step in and do things, oh my goodness, that's a rather inexact tool. You know, we've created lots of fine ivory towers and institutions to deal with issues for other people. And how well is that working out? You know, oh, not so good. So is there not another way where we could come together, find a way to do good, do well, you know, good ideas might be profitable. It's, it's just that exercise. Is there not another way? Don't, don't stop. Mm. No, really. I'd, I'd like to pick up on one thing before we close. One thing you said that I have, I have thought and I've seen in the past as a very valuable um, tool uh, in trying to ration, make things rational. You know, you have a lot of um, noise and fury in the press and by uh, organizations that think they're right but they're <laughs> not. Mm -hmm. um, who you know sort of churn up the political fodder, yeah. and then we get all confused and we lock up. We don't do anything. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the things that I've seen uh, in pockets on the mainland, uh, academic pockets mostly, is the is the survey. Mm -hmm. Is where mm -hmm. you go out, you know, and you say, wait a minute, we got one cohort yes. which is self interested on this point, making a lot of noise, but we really haven't heard from the people. That's it. They can't express themselves. That's it. So we will go out and we'll talk to them. We'll take a survey and find out how the great mass of people really feel. Yes. So it's not all twisted and contorted and angry. We'll just find out what people feel. That's this just is very helpful. Who's asking those questions? Almost no one. I mean, you know, occasionally political parties will poll, you know, or some candidate might poll. But generally speaking, you know, who amongst us is, uh, you know, polling? Like, your wonderful think tank uh, and, and Hawaii Venture Capital Association, you raise really good questions, you know, taking those out into the community, making them a poll, you know, taking away from some of your panels, you know, some of the questions that are raised, and then asking the community. 
that's what I would recommend. I really think we're on to a whole new age. I, I, like I said, I'm very optimistic about it because it is changing. There is a new social fabric. People are becoming engaged. And you, know, you even see it on the mainland debates after this Congress thing. You know, people are calling BS you know, on the BS. You know, they're saying, no, that's not true. No babies will be boiled in oil when Obamacare comes in. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're citing facts. They're saying, no, Ronald Reagan worked with people. No, no one's ever done this before. No, this is stupid. <laughs> and that's becoming part of the debate as well. So facts are getting in there. Facts are breaking This is out a good everywhere. thing. Yeah. And, and you know, thing. through all the tumult and the turmoil, we'll find a way. Hopefully Hawaii can find a way sooner because Hawaii has the tools, we you do. know, the spiritual residence to do this. That's Gordon Fuller, social entrepreneur, who is in fact aging and nicely, may I say, uh, and that's yeah. why we call this program Social Entrepreneurship in an Aging World with Gordon Fuller. Thank <laughs> you so much, Gordon. I hope I see you again soon. Yep. Very soon. I hope I see you, said the blind man. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, Gordon. Aloha, brother. <laughs>